First slide here is just a little invitation to a spring garden party we have at our nursery next Friday and Saturday. It's not too far away. It's just seven hours. It's a real easy trip, you know. I made it yesterday. I'm going to make it this afternoon. But if not, you can just like us on Facebook to see all of our pretty different plants because I post pictures usually every day. So that's just about that. We're going to do a tea demonstration and a demonstration on how to uh, do cuttings for camellias. All right, next. So today I'm going to be talking about camellias and the landscape, like various ways you can use them in your yards and everything. A lot of the pictures you'll see, we do landscaping and lawn service also. So most of the pictures are either at our customers' houses that we've done around the nursery. And then I needed a few more pictures, so I actually stole some from other landscapers that buy plants from us. And I told the guy, Steve, I was like, look, I'm stealing your pictures. He's like, huh? He's like, oh, okay. So, yeah. So they're all actually pictures of actual our plants. This is actually this house. This is Miss Dee's house. Miss Dee's house is featured a lot here, but you can see some different little camellias in there, but we'll get to that later. Next. First things first, what is a camellia? Camellia is a genus of plant in the family Thiasa. Thiasa means tea producing plant, but I'll talk about that in a minute because you drink tea, you're actually drinking camellia, a species of camellia leaf. The genus got its name from the Latinized version of Carl Linnaeus gave to it from uh, George Camel. He was a Mavarian born uh, monk. Linnaeus actually named a lot of various plants. He helped do a lot of the labeling in botany, like he gave gardenias their name and different stuff like that. There are over 250 species of camellias. Not all of them are found in the United States. You're probably thinking, what? You probably know more species than you realize. You just don't realize some of these ones you think are one. They're actually a different species. The most common are Japonica, Sasanqua, Sinensis, Pamalis, Bernalis, Reticulata, and Lifera. Some of these you're probably thinking, I have never seen those names before. But when I start naming some of the plants, you're going to be like, oh, that's that, not that. Next. First one I'm just going to kind of touch on are Japonicas. Most people, when they think of Camellia, they think of Japonica. Japonicas have large flowers, large leaves. They bloom January, February, March, sometimes into April, depending on how big the plant is or where you're located, but they need shade. They can take morning sun, not a lot of direct afternoon sun. Also, when I'm going through giving these presentations, I use a lot of pictures, so I like to explain, oh, that's that, that, and that, because people like to know what they are. These I actually labeled for you. Pink one at the end is debutante. That's a really nice, just pretty little flower. White Empress, R.L. Wheeler Variegated, Albaclina, and Beauvoir. Sasanquas. Okay. So Sasanquas so are another species everybody kind of knows. And there's a lot of different cultivars that get grouped into the Sasanquas. That's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. But the Sasanquas have small leaves, small blooms. They bloom more starting like September, October, November, December. They can take full sun, and you can also trim them and cut them to the size you want. The japonicas, not as much. The japonicas, you just gotta kinda plant and let them do their thing, and they form their pretty perfect little tree naturally. If you cut a japonica too much, sometimes it can get mad and it'll just die on you. The sasanqua, the more you cut it, the thicker, fuller, and prettier it's gonna get. Some popular ones are Setsugeka, Mr. B. Funny thing about Mr. B, Mr. B is also known as Alabama Beauty. Quite a few of these plants have different names, but where we're located in South Louisiana, nobody wants a plant called Alabama Beauty in their yard because we're just like 30 minutes away from LSU. So we sell it more in our areas, Mr. B, but customers in other states, like we do have customers in Alabama, they only want the Alabama Beauty. But when you have someone rolling up with decked out in LSU and I'm trying to explain to them, oh, this would be perfect. It's a pretty crimson color flower. I have to call it Mr. B or they'd kill me. Mino Yuki is another one. It has multiple names. Mino Yuki actually translates from Japanese to snow on the ridge to English. So it's also known as snow on the ridge, snow on the mountain, dove, white doves, snow. A thousand different little names. It's all the same plant. Mino Yuki gets grouped into being considered also like the white shishi because of its growth habit. It's a, lower, it's a lower mounding growth habit, but they can get bigger over time. 
but it stays pure white. Jean May is a little light pink. Hannah Jemmons a pretty little white with a pink tip. The same one. Next. Some of the other species that, like I said, you probably know these plants, you just didn't know they weren't sasanquas. The Hamalis, it's almost identical to a sasanqua. It's the leaves are actually a little bit bigger than a sasanqua. But you know the Shishi Gashera? Most people think it's a sasanqua. It's not, it's a Hymalis. Kinjera, which is another really popular one. It's a Hymalis, it's not a sasanqua. Vernalis is another one. Just like the sasanqua and everything it does, when it blooms, what it takes, the leaves are actually a little smaller. Yuletide, the little red Christmas one that blooms around Christmas, it's a Vernalis. Reticulata hybrids, if you go to any Camellia Society shows where you know they enter their blooms to win plates and all kinds of stuff, you'll see a lot of the Reticulatas because their blooms are just like the Japonica blooms, but they're actually bigger. Most Japonica blooms are kind of like this. Reticulatas are more like this. They're just massive, massive blooms. Oliferas are common. You just don't realize what they're common for. Anything you see that says it has tea tree oil in it, it's the olifera. It's the oil from the olifera. They're not really known for their flowers. Hybrids in general are just two crosses of many species. The most common we have is the high fragrance, which is this bottom one here. It puts off a really strong rose scent. And the hybrids, they, it depends on what it's crosses of as to what it actually can do. Like we have some hybrids that can take full sun, some need shade, some can do both. So it really is just a plant by plant thing. The sinensis is the tea plant. Tea dates back to 2737 BC. It's actually one of the oldest known plants that they've used for things. But the legend is that after a long day of work, the emperor was sitting under this tree. So you figure about 5,000 years ago, he's sitting under a tree. They were boiling water. Some of the leaves fell in it, and after a couple of minutes, he fished it out and drank it. He liked that sweet kind of zesty taste that left. That's how tea started, which he took his life in his own hands back then because he didn't know exactly what it was going to do, and it could have been a poisonous tree. Next. So now I'm going to talk about selecting the best camellias for your place. The one on the end is Hannah Jammin. This is Winter Snowman, Leslie Ann. Yumi, and that's another Setsugaka. Setsugaka can give you different looks on the plant. Next. The main thing is location, location, location. Any plant you plant in your yard, no matter what you're planting to plant, whether it's a camellia, gardenia, azalea, bedding plant, anything, know the spot. Know your sun sh shade issues. A lot of people think, oh, well, it's a western exposure. Because my first questions when people come to the nursery are, where are you putting it? What do you want it to do? How big can it get? And all these different questions. And they'll usually start with, oh, it's a Western exposure. That's not really helpful because like in my house, my Eastern exposure is my full sun. There's a bunch of trees on the West side, so it's shade. So you would think West actually means the afternoon sun, more sun, but it doesn't. You gotta kinda know, oh, well, it's gonna get sun from this time to this time. That helps more than knowing your cardinal directions actually. And then, is it a wet spot? Is it a dry spot? Kind of how's my soil? What's it gonna do? How much space do I have? The more information you have about the spot you wanna put a plant, the better it's gonna be for someone to help you find the right plant. Because you don't wanna have this spot, find this plant, and be like, oh, I love this plant, I'm gonna put it here, but it be a plant that's gonna get 10 foot tall, 10 foot wide, but you only have a three by three area. It'll be okay for a little bit, but eventually it's gonna outgrow it and you're gonna get tired of having to cut it and cut it and cut it. So like I said, just knowing the issues of your location is the main thing. And like camellias, they prefer to be on the dry side. So a spot that's gonna stay wet, no camellia would work. And honestly, a spot that stays wet, no real woody ornamental is gonna work, like azaleas, gardenias, or anything. You're gonna kinda of have to fix your drainage before you wanna put a plant in. So in spots close to the house, the Sasanquas work the best because you can control their size. You can kind of hedge them, trim them. Even though they can get bigger over time, they're slow growers. So they're not going to outgrow an area, but they give you the nice, thick, full look. In this example, this house, this back row right here, these are some of the peak snow Sasanquas. 
There's actually a line of some um, azaleas in there. It's one of the encores, I'm not really sure. But then there's little shishis. The little shishis only get about four foot tall, four foot wide, a mounded growth. So they're in front. So you can see you've got different levels because this person wants to grow the pink snow up a little bit. To go to the next slide. You can kind of see here, this is the other side of the house. She wants the pink snows to give her a little bit of hedge, not block the porch, but have the ones in front of it be lower. So knowing how you want to also mix and match things to give you layers is a big deal. This is one of another picture. This is one of Steve's pictures. Steve, our landscaper, buys from us. He only buys three gallons, and I'm always like, don't your people want something that might look a little bit bigger, a little more established? Nah, they cheap. It's okay. It'll grow. So, so that's why it kind of looks a little small. But if you notice, he has the line of the was the little, um, not the was. I get in the habit of calling she she's the was sometimes, too, because usually when I try to tell people, oh, the Camellia Himal is she she, they look at me like I'm speaking another language, and they don't know what I'm talking about. But the little shishis will form a nice little hedge, kind of like the pink snows will here. And then he has a bunch of little other things, little agapanthus, little grasses. But on the corners, he's got some winter snowman, which is a sasanko that grows a little more upright, kind of like bookends on the corner. So it'll give you a nice flat edge and then up, just to give you some dimensions around the house. Again, this is Miss Dee Dee's house, the one that was from the cover. She actually, Miss Dee Dee loves Christmas. That's like her big thing. So she has a hedge of the Vernalis, the Yuletide, because she wanted some easy Christmas decorations because they make little red bows with yellow stain in center, so it looks like Christmas bows. So it's almost like she has a bunch of Christmas bows in front of her house. But she's got some little compactas and some little azaleas in front and then some little limelight. Again, this is another one of Steve's. He's got the taller, Sasanquas on the side and the short ones in the front. The good thing about the Sasanquas, like I said, you can control their size. They give you blooms when not a lot of other stuff's blooming, but they stay shiny and green year round. So even when they're not blooming, you're going to have this really pretty shiny dark green leaf as a backdrop to whatever you put in front. So like if you wanted to put some vinca, some you can even put pansies in because they don't bloom the whole time pansies are blooming. Just any other little color in front of it. It's a nice little backdrop for it. They're just nice foundation plants. And another good thing about the camellias, once they're established, you don't have to worry about them. You don't have to worry about watering them. You can fertilize them if you want to. But after they're about five years old, you really don't have to worry about that either. Next. As a hedge. So Sanquas also make the best hedges because they grow a little bit faster. The Japonicas... Japonicas will get bigger over time, and they get nice, thick, and full, but they kind of give you more of a tree look. The Sasanquas, they grow faster. They give you that thick, full look, kind of like various uh, Cleara and Viburnums and stuff, but they bloom when other things aren't. It can just give you a wall of color during a time you're not really expecting any. This is actually a line at our nursery. We have a line of um, Sasanquas. These are the ones we take cuttings off of in our Camellia Walk. On the other side is a bunch of japonicas, but it kind of just blocks the walk from like the actual nursery part. Next. This, these right here, these are the congeros, the hymalus. These are just ones in pots, but can you imagine a line of those planted, blooming like that all at one time? That's what the sasanquas, the vernalis, and the hamalis look like when you have a mass planting of them. You just have walls of flowers. And they're actually good pollinators, too, because the bees are attracted to them. You wouldn't really think about bees in the winter, but they do. We have bees year-round coming to the camellias, especially the ones with the big yellow stamen. Tea plants also make nice hedges. That's what this line is here. It's kind of a double thing here. You can have the nice, thick hedge, because the more you cut a tea plant, the thicker, the fuller it gets. They have tiny little white blooms August through December. But you can also pluck the tea and harvest your own tea. So you can kind of do fun stuff with that. And it's really not hard. I'll be honest, I don't drink tea. I can tell you the history of tea, how to grow it, how to plant it, how to make it. I don't drink it. But we have various hedges of them around the nursery because, like, we're having the spring garden party next week. 
Now is the time you would start plucking tea. And it's a real easy process. You just pluck the end two leaves and the terminal bud off of each branch. So you don't want your tea plant to really get too, too tall if you want it for tea. If you want the hedge, let it go. But about four foot tall, four foot wide, if you're looking for something like that, it's perfect because then you can just walk around, pluck your tea, and you can get several uh, harvests off of um, one group. Because when you pluck, you're promoting new growth, so it's also going to get it thicker and fuller. Right, next. This is just to show you how fast they grow. This is another line at the nursery. You notice those are a bunch of seven gallons. There's some Mr. B, then there's like Winter Snowman and Mr. B, some Setsugaka. We planted a bunch of whites, but we put a red in between them so we would know which one. Again, we do all of our own cuttings to make our own plants, so we have them planted all over for production. That was three years ago. This was just the other day. So you can see how much they can actually grow so it's not a fast, fast growth rate, but it is a little faster than the japonica. Next. Around deciduous shrubs and trees. In the south, we love crepe myrtles, right? They're beautiful when they're blooming. In the winter, you have this nice little patch of sticks in your yard. So sanquas make great borders around them because if someone's coming to your house and you have this crepe myrtle that's nothing but sticks in the winter, they're driving up they're going to see something shiny and green that has blooms on it. So it draws the eye down as opposed to just the sticks. I mean, we know what the sticks are and they're beautiful, but it's just it's a nice contrast to kind of go with them. Or even if you have some hydrangeas planted in a flower bed or irises, daylilies, agapanthus, anything that dies back and comes back. If you have a few evergreens, it doesn't have to just be the sasanquas. The sasanquas do well because they're blooming at that time. So at least you know, oh, there's something pretty blooming here kind of all year. It hides it. It hides that kind of just open space. Like, we all know there's something there and there's something going to be there in a couple of months. But it just kind of detracts from just having the emptiness in the bed. Here you can see there's a crepe myrtle and he's got some little shishi kind of planted around it. Again, in this person's backyard, this is one of our customers. They went to one of the one of the Virgin Islands a couple of year a couple of years ago and decided they wanted their backyard to look like that. And my dad's like, I can make it look like that, but trust me, you're gonna want to put some other stuff in there. The first year he was like, No, 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 I only want the tropical. That winter he called my dad, My yard looks like crap. Like there's no plants back here. Everything's like dead. And my dad went, That's why I told you to put some evergreens back there. He's like, Okay, well let's come put some evergreens. So his wife wanted color year-round, so that's why we went back. We added some, um, I don't remember exactly which the same was these are around the ginger, but oh, when the ginger go to sleep for the winter, she's got some color. Around the hostas, the um, hydrangeas, little irises, everything, when those go away, she's got the little she-she's to bloom. So it kind of just, it makes your yard look more complete, especially if you do like the tropical looks, which, the tropical stuff's pretty at their time, but then they die back and there's nothing there. Next. Again, a little um, rising sun red bud tree, some little, I think those are sunshine with astrum, but a line of the shishis behind them. This is Miss Dee Dee's backyard. Again, if you notice, I talk about Miss Dee Dee a lot. She's actually a really good friend of the family and she posts pictures of her yard all the time on Facebook also. So we had some pictures when we first did it but I needed some pictures also of the things mature and grown up like this. So I just went and stole them from her Facebook page too. You know, Facebook's amazing nowadays to keep up with people and all that stuff. But notice she's got a bunch of little agapantha. She's got some little drift roses, the limelight. But she has a row of the magnolias. In between the magnolias and the limelight are actually a row of shishis. So when the limelights are gone and all the agapanthas, because where we are in South Louisiana, we can actually swim year-round, even without heated pools, because it was like 85 degrees Christmas this year, so we don't really have to worry about winter closing down pools and stuff. So she wants it pretty year-round. Now the shaded areas of your yard, for those of y'all thinking, okay, when's she gonna get to the Japonicos, the pretty ones that make the pretty blooms and stuff? Now this is the time. If you have a nice shady spot in your yard, and it, like I said, it doesn't matter if it's north, south, east, west. 
it's the sun. It can take direct sun up until about 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. After that, it's going to need some shade. It doesn't have to be like all day shade covering. If it comes through like the trees, kind of dappled, that's fine. That's when the japonicas do their best. They make the big, pretty flowers. They're going to give you these big, pretty specimen plants. This one, I missed it blooming by like a week. That's a big Kramer Supreme. Kramer Supreme's a big red flower. This plant is about 10 to 12 foot tall and about eight foot wide. It's hard to tell based on the picture, so I always like to give the size. But this is part of our camellia wall. If you notice, you can see it's kind of sunny behind it and there's sun kind of on the other side of it, but there is an oak tree giving it a good bit of shade. Next. Here's some more from the camellia wall. On this one, the outside is actually the line of the sasanquas. But if you notice, we even have some sasanquas mixed in on this side. With the big japonicas, we have little rows of shishis around them. So they do overlap some if you want to put like an actual garden in. Because this is going to sound really bad, but camellias are very slow growers, especially the japonicas. If you have a spot where you're worried about eventually it might get too, too big, I always tell people in about 10 to 15 years, it can be about 10 to 12 foot tall, maybe 10 foot wide, a little more or less. Your spot's a little bigger than that. Don't worry about it. Let the next person worry about it because this plant's gonna outlive all of us. They can live for hundreds of years if they're in a happy spot. I know that sounds like a really bad thing, but it could be worse. I mean, we're planting a pretty plant. We're not leaving pollution or waste or like a creepy building or something. You're leaving them a pretty plant to worry about. So I tell people, if you really like it and the site will be fine, just go with it. And just, like I said, let the next owner, let somebody else worry about it. Like I said, it's a horrible thing, but the oldest camellia on record, there's probably some older, but they actually have the date this one was planted. It was planted in 1347. And then I'm not even going to attempt to say the name of this nice Chinese monastery because it's about 15 letters long and there's like a strand of consonants in there. I'm like, I'm not even going to attempt it. I never do. It's still alive. So it's over 700 years old. But the tallest camellia on earth is still only 65 and a half foot tall. So you figure, you do the math, it's still not going to... In our lifetime, they're really not going to get to be where they're out of control. And you can do some light pruning, just not hard pruning. It's like it's starting to hit the house. You can just like take a branch off. You just can't hack it back like you can with the Sasanquas. But even on this one, um, that's a Lady Claire, the big uh, pink one in the middle. That's actually some Mino Yuki's around it. You notice the Mino Yuki's kind of have the same rounded growth shape as the Shishi. But they can get bigger eventually. Next. Again, this was the Mino Yuki's after three years from that other picture. So you can see they can get big kind of fast. And again, this is just another one of the Japonicas. I, we got really busy and I had full intention of taking all kinds of pictures of everything blooming and pretty. And then that just didn't happen. So I do apologize. There's not as many flowers in this. But the shishis with the big Japonica behind it. Next. Planting and care. This is almost the second most important thing as opposed to your location. Because you can have your great location, pick out the perfect plant. If you don't plant it right, you're gonna kill it. And then you just wasted all your time. Real quick, the one on the end down there, the red one, that's the Yule tie. See, it looks like a little Christmas bow. The pink one is Jean May. The middle one is a Shishi. Then the white and pink is Leslie Ann. Leslie Ann's one of my favorites because she's one of the few, Just she's just really pretty. And whenever I start talking about the planting care, you notice a lot of these plants have like names, like Jean May, Leslie Ann. I can be talking to people and I know I'm telling them this plant's not going to work here. Or I know they're just not going to follow in my directions. I'm thinking, bye Leslie, sorry you're going to die. You know, you have a nice life. But this one here, that's the tea plant. So you see they have lots of little white flowers. They're really, they're cute. They're different. And it is a pretty little hedge. All right, next. Again, location. Like I said, location is the most important thing with anything you plant. You have to know your spot. I can't stress that enough. I know I sound like I'm just repeating myself, but that really is so important for anything. But with the camellias, like I said, know your sun, know your shade. Um, you want to choose a location that's well draw, well, uh, that drains really well. Let me, I'm hot here. 
that drains well. And people are like, oh, well, it kind of stays wet after it rains. And I'm like, well, does it drain like within a day? Oh, yeah. I'm like, well, okay, everything kind of stays wet for a day after it rains. That's not that big of an issue. It's if it stays wet for two weeks after it rains or if it's just always wet. Because we had one person, oh, I'm going to plant these in the ditch. So I don't have to worry about water. And I'm like, I'm like, no. You know, they bought a bunch of plants and they all died. And he came back. He's like, they all died. I went, I told you. I'm like, I flat out told you. You plant these plants here because they'll bring pictures. I'm like, it's not going to work. Like, you can tell. It, it's going to die. They died. Oh, well, can I get a refund? I'm like, no. I'm like, like, you did exactly the opposite of what you were told. But you also, with camellias, would leave a um, space of five feet between plants. I know that sounds like a lot, but because they can get a little bit bigger, you do need to leave a little more space. The shishi and the Reverend Ida, which is just like the shishi, it's just it's a red, you can maybe do three feet if you wanted them to hedge together faster. But any of the other ones, especially the Sasank was five feet, Japonicas, you probably actually want to leave at least ten feet between them. Just they can give you their nice little shape. Right, next. Planting. Don't, don't freak out when you see the picture. It says one foot wider on each side. This is from the American Camellia Society. This is only for planting a really big one. You don't need to dig a hole two foot wider than the plant if you're only planting like a little one gallon or a three gallon. Just a little bit bigger than the plant. You just want to dig it up. The main thing is don't bury it. You want to leave an inch or two of the dirt that's in the pot above ground. You can kind of come even to it, but don't put dirt on top of it. Most plants prefer to be planted that way. They have roots at the top that want to breathe. And if you put a bunch of dirt and then a bunch of mulch, you're going to suffocate them. They're not going to be able to breathe. It's kind of like burying a person alive. You can bury your plant alive. So just leave it high. Like I said, that's the same for azaleas, gardenias. Most of your little woody ornamentals and trees want to be treated like that. Don't put a lot of dirt on top. Leave a little bit above ground. Kind of come even to it. And then here you can go next. Mulch. Pine straw really is the best. People usually don't like it because it's not the prettiest, but usually it's the cheapest. But it's also 100% dead when it hits the ground. So like cypress mulch and all that, sometimes they send the trees through the cutter before they're fully dead. So if there was a disease or a bug in there, it's going to pass on to your plant. Some of these other nice dyed ones, I'm not going to use names, that claim they can keep their color for years. If it can keep its color for seven years and rain, snow, sun, all that, what are they dyeing that plant with, that mulch with? It kind of makes you wonder because it will actually leak some. I had a friend who had a garden center and his main person quit on him right in the beginning of spring a couple of years ago. So I'm like, okay, I'll go help you out a couple of days. Just add to my schedule. He was bringing a bunch of one of the red dyed mulches. He had them in the back of his truck. He had a black bed liner. It had been raining. It stained the back of his bed liner. And then when we were getting them out, it looked like we had drug a dead body <laughs> across the black weed mat at the garden spot. We had to get gravel to put over there because it stained his bed liner and the black weed mat so much. It, it really looked like we had drug multiple dead bodies. And all we did was move 50 bags of it. 50 bags of red dyed, I'll say it was salt scape. So you're like, if that's leaking in that and it's staining plastic bed liners and the weed mat, what's it doing to the ground? So I tell people, if you really, really want the colored stuff, put a thin layer of the pine straw between it and then just a thin layer of it. But really, pine straw is the best. It holds back the weeds. It keeps the moisture in. It's just, it's great. It, you really, and like I said, it's usually cheaper. <laughs> Fertilizing. People are always like, oh, do I need to fertilize it? And my dad always just goes, well, do you have kids? They'll so be like, oh, yeah. Well, do you feed them? Well, yeah. Well, you want to water and feed your plants like your kids, you know. If not, they're going to die. Really, only the first five years, the camellias are in the ground. Do they really, really need the fertilizer? We do spring and fall. You want to use a nice, balanced number. And we use granular. We use, like, triple 10, triple 13, triple 8. Just kind of depends on the size of the plant. But the balance numbers work the best because you have a balanced level of everything. What happens in the fall and in the spring here sometimes? Oh, we'll put the fertilizer out and then we'll have 10 days straight of rain. 
that fertilizer will dump if you get too much rain. And if you have too much nitrogen or too much potassium, like some of these ones, like they have the fertilizer, it's called uh, Camellia Azalea Fertilizer. It's like 17, 6, 10 or something. If you're having too much of one nutrient hit the roots at one time, it'll throw it into shock. So nice balance numbers really work the best for our environment. Um, like I said, we just use that. Watering, once it's established, you really don't have to water it. For a camellia, it takes about a year for it to get established. After that, unless we're having really excessive heat and no rain for like a week, throw a little water on it. If not, it'll be fine. It really, it, it's just the first year. At the nursery, we water about two times a week if we're not getting rain. If it's really, really hot during the summer, sometimes we will water three times a week. But this past summer, the first half of summer, it was really wet. We, we didn't water for like four weeks at the nursery whatsoever because we were getting enough rain consistently. The second half, it got really hot and really dry. We were having the water look more. Same thing in the winter. Just make sure it's just consistent. You don't want it to dry out too much or get too, too wet. Just as long as it kind of stays nice and easy. All right, next. Some common problems. Do, am I, does anybody have any questions? I know I'm just like throwing a lot of stuff out here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, pine needles, pine straw, yeah. Yep. She asked when I said pine straw if I meant the pine needles. Yeah, the actual just pine needles that fall down. You can get it chopped, you can get it in the bale, best thing ever. So some common problems that you'll find with camellias. All right, first things first, the one on the end is Charlene Kinjero. Another Leslie Ann. Y'all notice y'all are seeing some of these same ones over and over. You can always figure out my favorites. That's Moonlight Bay, and that's another uh, Setsugaka. Next. Some popular camellias for the landscape. All right, first, one on the end is Pink Perfection. The second one is Professor Sargent. The middle one is Pink Snow, another Yuletide, and another Jean May. Next. The Camellia Hyamala Shishi Gashera. That's our biggest seller. We grow about 20 to 25,000 of these a year. And I will sell almost every single one each year. And that's from three, three gallons, seven gallons, 10 gallons, 15 gallons. People love them in the landscape because things go in and out of favor. So azaleas kind of went out of favor for a while using them around houses. So the shishis took their place, but people are actually realizing now, hey, if we mix these, we have more blooming seasons and blooming times, and they complement each other well. They get about four foot tall, four foot wide, nice little hot pink bloom, and it's a prolific bloomer. If you notice how many blooms, and this is just on a three gallon plant at the nursery, and you can see how many blooms are open at one time and how many buds are left. They start blooming about End of October, beginning of November, they can actually bloom through January. And the bigger they get, the more blooms they'll have. And I had one here, how it was an LSU Ag Center super plant because we're in LA. Yes. The shade, it can do shade or sun. It's a Heimless. That's the good thing about the Sasanquas. They can do shade or sun. The Japonicas can only do shade. Sasanquas can go either way. Next. The Mino Yuki. It's really popular because a lot of people use it kind of like the shishi because of the way it grows. It's just really pretty pure white. The flower is actually a little bit bigger than the shishi. It has a low spreading growth habit. They can get bigger over time, but they're really easy to hedge and control. Um, they bloom November through January as well. Next. The Reverend Ida. I talked about this one a minute ago. Again, it is identical to the shishi and the way it grows, its leaf, everything. The only difference is it's got a dark red flower. So I like to tell people when they're like, I want a shishi, but I don't want the pink shishi. I'm like, well, shishi is only pink. Like, that's that specific plant. So then I have to explain to them, well, no. Well, no, I want the, I'm like, well, I have, okay. So I go, I got red, white, or pink. Those are your choices. And then I try to explain to them. Some people, it's like, eh, they just know they want a different color. Next. Leslie Ann. Leslie Ann is another Sasanqua. She's really pretty. She's very popular because she's got the pretty little variegated flowers. She puts out lots of flowers. She has a nice little columnar growth habit. So people like to plant her as like bookends on flower beds or on corners to kind of just give them an accent or to frame doors. And again, they bloom at a time when not a lot of stuff blooms. 
They can get about six to eight foot tall, five to six foot wide, but you can keep them controlled. Over time, they can get a little bit bigger, but I always like to give people like the 10 year estimate of what it's gonna be, because that works the best with camellias. Next. Kinjaro is another hymalish. It's this really pretty fuchsia pink, but if you notice, you see how like the tips of each petal, it almost looks like someone put a little silver white glitter. That's not a reflection or anything. That's actually how the flower looks. It looks like someone put some silver white glitter in each petal. So when the sun hits it, it gives it a really pretty look. And they are prolific bloomers. Remember a few slides back, that picture that was here was just the line of them? That's Kinjaro. So Kinjaro is a popular hedge. Next. Cotton candy is another popular one. Cotton candy and pink snow are both popular ones for hedges because they grow fast, they grow thick, they grow dense. It's this really pretty pale pink. To the naked eye, if there's a hedge of cotton candy and pink snow, you won't be able to tell the difference if, one, if it's every other one, pink snow or cotton candy. You have to get right up to the bloom. Cotton candy has little white specks in it, kind of like cotton candy does. Pink snow has little lavender specks, but they're so small, you can't tell the difference. So I tell people if they have a hedge of them and one dies and they're not sure, this is probably the one where it doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to tell the difference. Next. Yuletide, again, it's popular because it looks like a little Christmas bow. It has the dark green little leaves and they're little prolific bloomers. Like I said, people like to add those just to kind of give them some color around Christmas and they named it aptly. It's good for hedges and it's access around houses. Next. I'm running low on time, so that's why I'm trying to rush so then y'all can ask questions. <laughs> the small leaf tea plant, small fragrant white blooms, blooms August through December, January. The bigger the plants get, whether it's a Sasanqua or a Japonica, the more buds they're gonna put out, the longer your blooming season will be. So sometimes these blooming seasons will get longer the bigger the plant gets. You can make your own tea from it. It's really easy to make. That I make it, I just drink it. But they really are great for hedges because they are the fastest growing camellia there is. They can double their size in a year. No other camellia can do that. Next. High fragrance is our second most popular one. It needs the shade. It's a hybrid, but it has more of the Japonica tendencies, the big leaves, the big blooms, blooms January, February, March. It's one of the few that has a strong scent. It smells like a rose. If there was one high fragrance in here blooming right now, and I had it right here, we would smell it instead of the lady doing the nuts over there, the cinnamon and everything. Like that's how strong of a fragrance it is. They're great. I tell people if they don't have shade, but they really want a japonica, get this one. Get you a nice pot to put like on a covered porch or a patio. Because they're slow growers, they can last in the pots for five to ten years before you have to worry about transplanting it but it's pretty, it's light pink to darker pink shading. Next. La peppermint's a really popular orange simply because it looks like a peppermint. Where we are in Louisiana, everyone thinks the La stands for Louisiana and think it's Louisiana peppermint. It's not, it was developed in Sacramento, California actually. The guy who developed its wife liked French things, so he threw the La in front of it just to kind of mess with her. But it is pretty. It can go from the full peppermint look with the white with the red. It can be pale pink with darker red. It can be solid pink or solid red. Variegated flowers can give you solids of whatever colors are mixed in. So it's really, they're cute. It, it's just a nice little accent one because it's a nice variegated one. Next. Sea foam. Sea foam is a popular one because it's just this pure white flower. It's a large flower. It's a sturdy flower. I know y'all get the ice and the snow up here. A couple of years ago when we got it, I had some sea foams blooming. I had a sea foam bloom I took the picture of that first day. It was just kind of chilly, it was perfect. The next day I have a picture of it covered in ice. The next day it was still covered in ice. A week later it was still a perfect white bloom, which is really odd for a white, because white usually fades and gets just nasty after the element. Sea foam doesn't, sea foam lasts a long time. Next. Royal Velvet's another really popular one. This is another shade one because it's just this deep red with the yellow stain in the center. And it has these really pretty deep green leaves. And it's just a pretty plant. Some of these camellias are not pretty plants. We have one called Black Magic. The flower is breathtaking. It's waxy. 
It's a deeper red than that, but it has the yellow stamen centers. It's roughly, I don't even include it in this because we sell out of them every year, like as soon as they become available. But it's the ugliest plant you will ever see. <laughs> the leaves have really like serrated edges on them. They have black spots on the leaves. It's never like a full plant. It's never like a full, full, pretty plant. But the flower's worth it. So I tell people, plant it in the back where no one will see it and just go flip the flowers. Next. Purple Dawn is just a traditional one. Purple Dawn's actual name is Methoniata, but it got the nickname Purple Dawn because the longer it's in the ground and the more acidic your soil, it will actually have a purple tint to the outside of it. So that's how it got the name Purple Dawn, and it's actually known better as Purple Dawn now. It is not a formal double. A lot of people think it is. It can actually open up to show a little bit of a stain in center. Nine times out of ten, it won't. It's a rose form double. Every year when they open up to show it, because they won't do it every year, I always get people calling, something's wrong. I'm like, nothing's wrong, I promise, I promise. So I just send them the definition. But it's an old one, and it's just it's a popular one. Next. My time's up, so that's why I'm trying to talk even a little faster. Tricolor Superba. It's another, it's just, it's a really big bloom. And it's just these really pretty variegations of the light pink to dark pink. It's a big bloom. It's one of the Serrata ones. Serrata was um, Overlook Nursery down in um, Mobile, Alabama. Eudora Welty had a bunch of his. She liked him. I'm just throwing some other random facts in there that I don't have time to throw in, but you know. But it's a really pretty one. It's got these dark, they all have dark green leaves, but some of them are like a few shades darker. So I hate to say it almost makes the flowers pop a little bit more. And this is one of them. Next. Taylor's Perfection is a hybrid. It's a hybrid that can take full sun. I tell people who have the full sun, but they want the japonica look, this is their plant. It can take full sun, it has a big flower like a japonica, and it blooms when the japonica's blooming. So you kind of get the best of both worlds, but it's more like a sasanqua and the flower will fall apart. You can't like cut it and float it and pick it. So it does have those sasanqua flower tendencies, but it's a nice big flower. And it's a late bloomer also, like they're still blooming at the nursery. Most of our camellias are done. This one, Victory Manual, and a few more are still showing some color. Next, camellia fun facts. So, not that we have time for this. These are all flowers y'all seen before, don't worry. <laughs> Let's see, so I've told you how they can live 102 years. I think I actually cover most of this, and some of this is just some tea facts which, you know, tea is the second most widely drank beverage in the world after water. Just, just some little fun stuff. Um, since we have, we're out of time, I'm gonna go ahead, are there any questions? Okay, first things first, yes ma'am. Deer. Deer. Yeah. <laughs> There's a way you can kind of take care of the deer, but I don't want to say it on the microphone. <laughs> and it doesn't involve a gun, so don't think it's that. Just say people urine. It's people urine. Human, what's the first thing the hunter does when they go hunting? They mask their odor. What's our strongest odor? So just, I hate to say, get somebody to pee in a bottle and just go shake it around your yard about once a week in order to keep the deer away. Does it really work? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. It really does. Yeah. All right. Next. Yes, sir. How do you, how do you reproduce these? Like, how do you proceed? Camellias are reproduced in, like, three ways. Cuttings. We do cuttings, which is just taking a cut of new growth off the plant, and then there's the process. It's, it's kind of a long process, or you can do grafting. We don't do grafting because you actually, you're cutting basically a sasanqua to get a japonica to grow on it. You have to always cut the sasanqua out of it. And it's just, we just don't do that because number one, why would we kill a sasanqua or try to kill a sasanqua? We don't want to give somebody a plant that has to be, anything that usually has to be grafted means it's genetically weak on its own rootstock. I don't want to sell a plant to somebody that's already kind of, Week. but grafting can get you a plant faster but again you're constantly gonna have to cut the sasanqua out see there's also air layering um which is you just do something with the stem seeds for camellias camellias are the one plant seeds will not give you the same plant it's either going to give you a new plant with a different flower a plant with no flower or nothing and you won't know for like five to seven years after you plant the seed what it's going to do. Okay. You had a, you had your hand up, ma'am. Any other questions? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Gill. The smallest camellia is probably the shishi. 
because it only gets about four foot tall, four foot wide. And a lot of people are like, well, that's still tall. But in the plant world, anything four foot and smaller is considered a dwarf. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah, she asked if she plants one and she realizes it's not the best spot, when it's the best time to move it or if it can be moved. If it, it depends on how stressed the plant is. You can do it whenever, actually, because anything container grown can be planted year round. The only time you got to really watch about, oh, falls, the best time for planting is if you're digging something up because you're cutting the roots and so it's going to go into shock. But a plant that's grown in a pot, it's going to be happy any time of the year to get out of that pot and have some more room. So you just want to watch. If it's in a lot of stress, do it as soon as possible. Before you just replant it, though, get a pot, put it back in a pot, nurse it back to health, and then plant it again. You'll have more success. Anything else? Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank you, Kate.